I uh, inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 33 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter was received uh, from Senator Thorpe. Uh, sorry, two seconds. Uh, that stage three tax cuts will cost $244 billion over the next 10 years and give billionaires, CEOs and politicians a $9,000 tax cut, while people on the minimum wage get nothing. Repealing these unfair and unjust tax cuts would fund immediate cost of living relief and make people's lives better by putting dental and mental health care into Medicare, building, uh, building affordable housing and making childcare free. I understand that formal arrangements have been made to. Oh, sorry, uh, is this proposal supported? Indeed. Okay. Uh, I understand that formal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall call the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last week, the uh, Prime Minister sorry. announced that uh, the Labor government— Sorry, Senator Thorpe. Can I just get you to move the motion first? Oh. My apologies. Uh, I move the motion. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last week, the Prime Minister announced that the Labor government will not be repealing the obscene Stage 3 tax cuts. Over the next 10 years, these will strip $244 billion out of the budget. You will all be aware by now how these cuts are benefiting the most wealthy people in this country, usually the ones that are responsible for the stolen wealth, but that's another story. This means that men will get $2 one dollar more than women receive. However, there has been little consideration for how these tax cuts will impact on First Nations people. And as always, my people will benefit the least. Across the country, every day, in everyday people in this country are struggling to make ends meet in the most simple ways. People are struggling to pay rent, pay for food, pay for health care, and too often those impacted the most by cost of living pressures are First Nations people. In the lucky country, the average personal income for First Nations people was around $35,000, compared to just under $50,000 for the rest of the population. That's 29 per cent lower. That will have lifelong impacts on my people's lives. With the proposed tax cuts, First Nations people will be paying, on average, $95 less tax in 2024 and 2025, compared to $430 less tax paid by non-First Nations people. This means that First Nations people will receive about $1 for every $4 others get from stage three tax cuts. First Nations people will see the least benefit and be the hardest hit by this tax reform. These tax cuts will only worsen income inequality between First Nations people and the rest of the population. If the government allows these tax cuts to go ahead, it is choosing to give handouts to the stolen wealth billionaires instead of funding crucial services that our people are calling out for. The $244 billion could be redirected towards funding community-controlled health, housing and legal services that would and could pull thousands of people in this country, and in particular First Nations people, out of poverty. If this Labor government is truly committed to closing the gap, 
they will scrap these tax cuts and put the money back into providing proper housing, proper health care, good education for First Nations people in this country. We know that stolen wealth is also an issue in this country. And many, many people, many white people, many of the colonisers actually benefited from stealing these lands. In fact, they still benefit today because of generations and generations of wealth creation for their families. And I'm sure you know that story. But it's time to pay the rent and it's time to acknowledge that you're on stolen land. Uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the urgency motion before the Senate today. Uh, and during the election, we made a commitment that we would provide certainty and clarity around tax to Australian working families. And our position on the legislated stage three income tax cuts uh, has not changed since the election. Because after an incredibly difficult few years for our country and the world, certainty is what Australians deserve. The legislated stage three tax cuts are not due to commence for another two years. And so they won't do anything to address the near-term economic challenges that we face, including uh, with the growing inflation challenge that we have right now. Uh, instead, our government's priority when it comes to tax reform is ensuring that multinationals pay their fair share of tax here in Australia. And uh, our priority is cracking down on the waste and the rorts that have contributed to the $1 trillion of debt left to us by those opposite with absolutely nothing to show for it. A trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it. We, uh, the Albanese government, need to repair the budget mess left by those on the other side so we can get on with delivering the meaningful investments that maximise economic impact and meet community needs. Australians are paying the price right now for a decade of missed opportunities and absolutely messed up priorities under the coalition government. A trillion dollars of debt, high and rising inflation, rising interest rates and a cost of living crisis. These are the consequences of a, dec a decade of complete economic mismanagement by those opposite. And Australians understand that we didn't create these challenges, but they elected us to take responsibility for fixing them, for addressing them, and we are. Our economic plan is a direct and deliberate response to the challenges facing the economy, including the rising cost of living that is hurting so many Australians today. We are getting on with the job and we are delivering on our commitments. We are delivering on a better future for all Australians. We committed to rebuilding our economy with stronger wages and more secure work, and we are doing that. One of the very first acts of our government was to successfully argue for a minimum wage increase for our lowest paid workers. Uh, and that was, an, an out, that was an outcome which helped around 2.8 million Australians. Uh, and we followed that with a submission to the Fair Work Commission that unequivocally supports a wage increase for aged care workers, for the tens of thousands of aged care workers who do essential work every day but are completely undervalued with absolutely no action from those on the opposition benches. We brought employers, unions and the community sector together at the Jobs and Skills Summit to discuss how we can get wages moving, how we can lift living standards and how we can improve productivity, um, which was nothing short of sluggish under the previous government. And in so doing, um, we've ended up with uh, a positive plan, bringing unions and employers together with the government. Uh, and in so doing, we've ended the decade of division and delay from those opposite. We are delivering concrete outcomes from our Jobs and Skills Summit. We're delivering 
consensus on the need to improve the bargaining system and get wages moving again, as well as allowing age pensioners to work more and more and earn more before it affects their pension. We committed to investing in Australian skills, in Australian jobs, in Australian manufacturing. Uh, and as the new government, we are doing it. We've secured a one billion national skills agreement with the states and the territories. Uh, we're delivering 180,000 fee-free TAFE places in 2023, with 15,000 set aside for aged care to meet the workforce challenges uh, that we've been left with by a decade of inaction from the previous government. Uh, and we're working hard to deliver on our commitment to invest in advanced manufacturing. We committed to backing clean energy and ending the climate wars, and we are doing it. We have reset Australia's commitment to action on climate on the world stage, sending a huge signal, an important signal, to the rest of the world that Australia is at the table, that Australia will do our part in the race towards net zero. Uh, we're working just this week right here, right now, to legislate our target of a 43 per cent reduction in emissions by 2030. Uh, and part of that is ensuring that our government is accountable to these targets uh, and providing the certainty that the Australian people want that we will actually deliver against those targets. As part of our response to the climate crisis, we're making electric vehicles cheaper with our electric vehicle discount bill this week, uh, which we hope the opposition will support, uh, and our national electric vehicle strategy. And we are securing Australia's future by delivering our Powering Australia plan. We are making the largest ever upgrade to our energy grid and driving down power prices for households and small businesses, again after a decade of complete inaction by those on the other side. We also committed to easing cost of living pressures for Australian families, and we are doing that too. We are getting on with the commitments that we made, and we are delivering them. Our budget in October will include our plans for cheaper childcare, and that will make a huge difference to the household budgets for millions of Australians. Uh, next year, 96 per cent of Australian families will benefit from cheaper uh, early learning. Um, they will benefit from quality, affordable early childhood education under the plans that our government took to the election, under the plans that we are ready to implement right now. Uh, and we are removing the penalty for parents taking on extra hours or extra days of work. Uh, and of course, that was a huge priority that came out of the Jobs and Skills Summit. Uh, we know that one of the biggest things we can do as a nation to improve workforce participation is encourage more carers of small children into the workforce. That's usually women, uh, and so providing quality, affordable, accessible early education is critical to our, nat our nation's economic future. Today we've introduced legislation to reduce the cost of essential medicines, the first time any government has reduced the PBS co-payment. Uh, and what that is going to mean for people uh, is around um, $30 less um, per month um, for essential medicines that people are accessing on the PBS, um, saving around $300 a year um, for the average person uh, who re is relying on those PBS medicines. So we're helping to ensure that fewer people have to miss filling a script because they just can't afford it. Uh, and the stories of people having to do that are extraordinary. We don't want people to have to choose between taking painkilling medication on the one hand uh, and another medication they need to address their underlying condition. That should not be happening in Australia, and we are getting on with fixing that problem. There is no denying that the last few years have been difficult. We know that Australians are doing it incredibly tough. We don't need economic forecasts to tell us that because we are listening to Australians every day. And what Australians want is certainty from their government on the way forward. They want a government that does what it said it would do 
and that is the Albanese government. They want a government that will stick to our word and deliver on our commitments. It's exactly what we're doing. The legacy of those opposite is a decade of mistakes and missed opportunities, a decade of waste and rorts, a decade of division and delay. They had no plans past the last election. They had no vision for anyone's future but their own. In May, Australians sent a strong and clear message. They wanted change. They wanted a government they could trust, a government who would bring the country together, not divide it, and a government with a plan to address the challenges that families and businesses are facing right now. And that's exactly what we are delivering. The Albanese Labor government was elected with a clear and ambitious plan to build a stronger, more equal Australia. That's what we're doing. We're keeping our promises and working hard to deliver the better future Australians deserve. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, well, what we need uh, as a country right now is to grow our economy, to, uh, uh, to increase the size of the pie, uh, so to speak, because that is the best way to manage the uh, enormous public debt uh, we now have. Uh, first, thanks to the uh, excessive spending of the Rudd-Gillard years and uh, then over the last couple of years because of our necessary response to a global pandemic. We now, of course, uh, uh, have a, a public debt of uh, approaching or, or soon to be above uh, $1 trillion. And, 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 and the best way uh, to help manage that, to deal with that, uh, is to grow our economy. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, we'll, by doing so, uh, we'll have more tax revenues, more wealth uh, to manage that debt. We now have, or we do now have, a debt to national income or GDP ratio uh, at a level we haven't seen since uh, the years after World War II. Uh, and in the years after World War II, the way we came back from that crushing level of debt uh, after defeating uh, the evil of fascism uh, was to grow our economy. Uh, the economic growth of the 50s and 60s were periods of uh, uh, a massive uh, economic change and growth in this country we have not ever seen. Uh, that was on the back of the, the, the world opening up after the, the war, uh, the Menzies government uh, at the time keeping a, an open and, and uh, uh, vibrant economy. And we need to learn those lessons here after a global pandemic, uh, which has not been as devastating as that war, but has left similar consequences of large public debt. We have to keep an open economy. We have to get our tax rates down and be competitive so people will invest and work and thrive in this country uh, and make more wealth for all of us. The reality right now is that our tax system is not competitive uh, to the rest of the world, especially our personal income tax uh, system. Uh, we have a high corporate tax rate, but it's often forgotten or not commented that we have a, a franking credit system, that we do not double tax corporate profits. And so our actual impact of the corporate, profit, corporate tax rate of 30 per cent is not as high as it might seem on a direct comparison with overseas countries, because when you get dividends, you can also usually get franked credits if the company's paid taxes on that, and you won't pay your top marginal rate. You'll pay the difference between the marginal rate and the corporate rate. But uh, there's no such, no such equalising factor uh, for those earning labour income and the workers of this country. They get slugged at a rate that is higher, much higher than the rest of the world. Our top rate of uh, 45 per cent, or really 47 per cent when you add the Medicare levy, uh, cutting it at $180,000 a year is one of the highest rates in the developed world, and it cuts in at a level of income uh, much lower than many other countries in the rest of the world. To, to use a few examples, uh, in the United Kingdom, their, their top rate is about ours at 45 per cent, but it doesn't cut in until someone earns 150,000 pounds. That's over 260,000 Australian dollars. In the United States, uh, the, the top rate is just 37 per cent, a full 10, 10 percentage points lower than Australia. And even in New Zealand, uh, their top rate is just 39 per cent. So we're way out of whack with many of our comparable countries uh, that would be competing for talent, especially in a world where borders are opened up and people can move. Uh, uh, additionally, we also have high tax rates below that level for middle income people. And what the stage three tax cuts are all about is making sure that middle income people can have the aspiration to become higher income people and become healthier and provide a better future uh, for their children. Because these tax cuts, these tax cuts, the so called stage three tax cuts that cut in or come in uh, in 2024-25, will actually provide a, a tax cut, a tax saving for any Australian that earns over $45,000 a year. 
That is a lot of people. That's a, a lot of Australians. In fact, 95 per cent of Australian, Australian taxpayers will benefit uh, from, uh, from these tax cuts in a few years' time. So we hear a lot of rhetoric about these tax cuts being for the rich uh, and benefiting those that are well-to-do. Well, we've got to look at the whole series of tax cuts here, that these tax cuts will uh, get rid of one whole tax bracket, make our system much simpler and easier uh, for people. Uh, the 37 cents tax bracket will go. Uh, the tax rate will be 30 cents in the dollar for anyone over earning over four, well, no more than 30 cents in the dollar for sorry 30 cents in the dollar at least for anyone over earning over $45,000, and then the top rate will only kick in at $200,000, which will remain the same. Uh, so that is a big tax cut for Middle Australia. The stage three tax cuts are a tax cut uh, for Middle Australia. Those Australians dead smack in the middle class. Earn money, earn income, somewhere between around that $45,000 a year up through to $200,000 a year. That is middle Australia. Uh, they, they, some of those people at the higher end are very lucky and do very well, but all of them probably have worked hard in their life to get to that level and they deserve reward for effort. We want to encourage Australians uh, to continue that effort, future Australians to continue that, so these tax cuts are the right time at the right place for our country. If we continue to have higher uh, tax rates uh, than the rest of the world, that will punish effort. It will mean people will think twice about why start a business, why go and uh, work a bit harder to try and get ahead, to maybe uh, put your kids through school or, or do something when the tax office is going to take so much of what you earn. Because the other point to make here is look, already in this country, people, the average tax rate just sits over at 30 cents in the dollar or so. That's not the marginal rates, but the average rates that people pay. And that means, when you think about it, that means that you know, when, you go to, when most people work, start work on a Monday, all of Monday is for the tax office, all of it. Every bit of work they do on the Monday is for this place, is for money to come down here uh, uh, to Canberra. And then most of, a little bit of Tuesday too, about half of Tuesday for the average taxpayer. Also, you start the day on Tuesday, you're also on the Canberra clock, uh, just working uh, for the government down here. It's not until after Smoko on Tuesday afternoon that you actually get to work for yourself. That's when you start getting to work for yourself. And what we're saying is maybe, maybe we should move that, that, uh, that, that, that point from lunchtime to morning tea so you, you can, from big lunch to little lunch if you like, so you, you can earn a little bit more for yourself and take it home for your family uh, to help them and, and, and give them a better future. Because, I don't know, I've been here a few years now and uh, I don't think we spend that money all that well. Uh, I don't think uh, that uh, supporting this motion, if we supported this motion, say let's 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 not let's. I don't think you're going to do any better, Senator Chisholm. I think it's a disease in this place that the money that comes here, a lot of it gets wasted. A lot of your money, that work you do on that Monday and Tuesday morning, doesn't always generate uh, the public services that some people like to claim down here. And maybe, maybe, if we do have an issue with affording the stage three tax cuts of having to deal, at least temporarily, with a bit of lower tax revenue, we could look at what, what is spent here in Canberra, in the bureaucracy, uh, to make sure your money, your hard work, is actually providing value for the Australian people. Because you know, every Australian family does that. And if after if, if these tax cuts, hopefully, ho ho hope, hoping God, they go through, and, and those, that middle Australia gets a little bit more money, uh, to take home. I know they'll spend it very carefully. They'll think about where that money should go and how it should help their children and their families. I'm not so sure we always do here. And, and that's why we can afford these tax cuts and they will make for a stronger, stronger Australia if they go through. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. People want a fair tax system. They recognise that paying tax in Australia allows us to have the quality of life that we have. It allows us to have the services that we have. And don't be conned by Senator Canavan that taxes simply come to Canberra. Taxes are paying Medicare. They're providing funds for, for aged care so that our elderly can actually live in dignity. They're providing a world-class medical system here, here, in, here in Australia. We've heard so much from the Labor government over the last 108 days about the failures of the Liberal National Government. Everything's their fault. They've inherited 
a total mess, worse than they possibly thought. They didn't create any of these challenges, but they're going to fix it, which is great. You can't say that and at the same time stand by bad policy when it comes to stage three tax cuts. We're in a cost of living crisis. We're going to give the wealthiest Australians. Yes, some people on lower wages will get some tax back. But if you're a registered nurse on $72,000 a year, you'll have an extra 681 bucks in your pocket. If you're a politician here, like, Mr. Mr. like Senator Canavan, on $211,000, you're getting $9,000 back. I don't see the fairness in that. And I think Australians at this time would recognise that this is not the way that we want to go. This is not how we should be spending our money, given the challenges that we face. We hear from the Labor government that they can't afford to increase shared paid parental leave. That has consensus coming out of their Jobs and Skills Summit. There simply isn't the money. Well, here's $243 billion that we're going to give back mostly to wealthy Australians, mostly to men, rather than actually spending it on things that Australians want. Actually spending on addressing the crises that we face, the cost of living crisis. We've got people here in Canberra who we're now calling the working homeless. That's, that is shameful for a country like Australia, to be still considering these tax cuts when so many people are doing it tough. And the Labor government should be ashamed of this decision. It is unconscionable to stand by this when you're the new government, to stand by bad policy that may have been justifiable years ago when it was, when it was legislated. Sure, there may have been, a, been an argument for it, a lot, a lot has happened since then. We had bushfires. We've had a two-year global pandemic. We've had geopolitical con conflict, Russia invading Ukraine, energy prices going through the roof, rising inflation, cost of living. Cost of living pressures putting so many everyday Australians under strain. And the Labor government wants to give $243 billion to mostly the most wealthy, wealthy Australians, mostly men. It's frankly ridiculous, and the pressure's only going to mount. I'd urge you to use your political capital. We hear a lot about how popular the, the new Labor government is. Use that. Be decisive. This is not going away. This is going to come into effect just before the next election. It'd be really interested to see how that, that plays out, given how tough so many Australians are doing. Senator Pocock. Uh, Senator Bragg. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And uh, it's always good to know when the clock starts ticking, because that's the uh, opportunity to make some remarks about this uh, very important matter. Now, of course, when it comes to the philosophy here, uh, it is very clear that there are different views about the role of the state and the role of uh, money within our society and within our economy. Uh, personally, my view has always been that the state has no money of its own. Uh, it must go and levy that from its citizens. And that is what we do. And we do that to provide services and the like. Uh, and we've done it in the last few years on a scale that hasn't been seen for some decades as a result of this uh, economic shock and um, health crisis. Uh, but uh, in relation to philosophy, um, we are committed to the idea that people's money is their own and we should only seek to levy their incomes and salaries and wages uh, to pay for services which are required and nothing more than that. Now, the stage three tax cuts, as they're called, and I think in hindsight it was a mistake to have uh, broken it down into three stages, it should have been done in one go, uh, are effectively saying, uh, look, we're going to simplify the five brackets down to four and we're going to ensure that middle income earners in particular are able to work an extra shift or do some extra work and not be penalised. 
uh, by being pushed into a higher uh, income bracket, and people might, for example, be uh, paying uh, 32 and a half cents in the dollar rather than 30, 30 cents in the dollar if these uh, tax cuts were repealed. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a proposition of repealing tax cuts, which would result in a tax increase. Uh, and it would result in a tax in increase to, uh, yes, higher income earners, and it would also result in a significant tax increase to middle income earners. Uh, people who are earning sixty or seventy thousand uh, dollars would pay additional taxation because they would be pushed into a higher tax bracket. We'd be going back to five tax brackets, which would not be in their interests. We want to have an economy where people want to work, additional shifts, uh, take on more hours uh, if they want to. Um, now I know it's not fashionable to look at the issues facing the higher end of the tax spectrum. But the reality is that the people that were here last week at the Jobs and Skills Summit were talking about the issues that face Australian business. And I think legitimately they have raised the issue of access to skills. Now, we are in a point in our history where we are competing for capital and we are competing for labour, skilled labour. And if you look at our closest competitors, uh, their tax rate, their top tax rate, uh, cuts in, in the case of Singapore, at 335,000 Australian dollars, and in Japan's case, 417,000 dollars. So we're looking at almost double our threshold, which is quite low compared to our competitors. And if we are serious about this nation's competitive position, and we are serious about attracting skilled people to take on roles in this country where Australian businesses are saying they can't get access to these people's skills, then why would we want to put lead in our own saddlebags and have an even more uncompetitive situation in relation to taxation? And sure, I know that part of the argument may not be particularly fashionable, but that is the truth, that at $200,000 uh, it is a relatively low threshold relative to our competitors. And we can imagine ourselves as some locked away, protected, subsidised economy as we had in the 1970s and 80s, and you can look at the history books and see how that went, or we can be realistic and honest about the challenges the nation faces in relation to skilled workers. And uh, that, is, that is the truth. So the middle income earners would face a tax increase by being dragged into a higher bracket. And it will be harder to attract higher income earners which are needed to fill the skill gaps that we heard about last week at the talk fest. And we've heard the Treasurer today talk about his 36 concrete recommendations. Well, I mean, if you can go and listen to the business people, they will say to you that access to skills uh, is one of the most important things. So, um, look, it, it is true that the government cannot be held uh, as responsible for every single problem in the economy. And having been in office for a relatively short period of time, uh, it would be ridiculous to claim that um, all the ills should be put at their feet. But over the medium to long term, uh, you have to try and get the fundamental position right. And that is that we, are, we need to be a dynamic economy whereby we have a competitive tax system and a flexible labour market which allows our businesses to be competitive. Now, clearly, uh, on a day that the RBA has uh, decided that it will, will raise interest rates, and that will make it difficult for people with, which have large, who have large mortgages, and certainly representing New South Wales, I'm very aware that there are people with large Sydney mortgages that will be finding this recent uptick in interest rates very difficult. Um, and I'm pleased the government is reviewing the RBA. Uh, I would say that uh, the RBA governor, whilst not making any personal criticism of him, um, has made statements in the past that didn't need to be made, that set market expectations uh, in a way that I think has made things 
more difficult than they should have been. Um, sometimes it's better to say fewer things. Sometimes fewer words are better. And uh, I do think that uh, there are a lot of people now that will struggle with paying uh, their mortgage repayments. And some of the, the Commonwealth Bank data shows that 30 to 35 per cent of people uh, in the capital cities um, are on a very thread, have a very threadbare position when it comes to paying back uh, their mortgages. So um, ultimately, um, we don't want to make things any harder than, than they will be. And one thing that would make it harder for people would be to increase taxation, because by increasing taxation, we'll be saying to the rest of the world, we're not interested in new investment, we're not interested in, in having a dynamic and competitive economy, and therefore there will be fewer jobs, there will be fewer high-paying jobs, and of course one of the things that's within the government's preserve is tax policy. And there is no case to remove the tax cuts uh, that are designed to improve the investment profile of the country, and any removal of those tax cuts would be a tax increase. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Uh, call Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, I think we're in a parallel universe because the people of Australia just voted to change the government, and yet the new government is keeping the policies of the last government. Now, people understand that a budget and governing is about choices. And they hear it loud and clear when the Prime Minister talks about how choices are being made. What this government is doing is choosing to keep the stage three tax cuts. They are actively choosing to give $244 billion over 10 years to people that are CEOs, that are billionaires and that are politicians. All of those folk are going to get about a $9,000 tax cut every year. Now, we're in a cost of living crisis. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. Why, of all things, would you be giving tax cuts to the rich when people are struggling to meet their daily cost of living challenges? Budgets are about choices. The Australian people did vote for a new government. Why are you keeping the policies of the last one? They weren't right then and they're even less right now. It is the most ill-timed policy decision that you could possibly make, and I think it is a betrayal of everyone that voted Labor, that you are going to keep the stage three tax cuts. They are now your stage three tax cuts, I'm afraid. These are now Labor's stage three tax cuts for the wealthy, when at the same time the new government is saying the country's too poor to make childcare free. The country is too poor to fix homelessness. The country is too poor to make uh, Medicare include dental and mental health. I'm sorry, but that is just heartbreaking nonsense. If you axed those stage three tax cuts, PBO costings show that you could, in fact, end homelessness, make childcare free and put dental and mental health care into Medicare. Those are the sorts of things that will provide real cost of living relief to people and provide services on which they deserve to be able to rely and access free of charge. Now, on childcare, we've got 1,000 childcare uh, sector, uh, centres striking today because they are begging for better pay and conditions. So we could also make childcare free uh, for parents, but we should be paying those workers more. You could do that with the $244 billion over 10 years. Pay women more. Have a legislated increase above CPI to feminised industries. We heard a lot of talk at the Jobs Summit last week about women's workforce participation. There's a great idea. Pay women more. Then they won't have to strike out the front of Parliament House uh, desperately pleading for pay and conditions that reflects the calibre of their work and the importance of their work in raising the next generation. Free childcare would cost $9 billion a year. Now That's a lot of money, but that would ensure women can get back into the workforce. Importantly, it would ensure that kids get the best early childhood education that they uh, deserve, that sets them up for a bright future. And of course, it will reduce uh, the, uh, not only the gender pay gap, but it will reduce the unfair distribution of unpaid labour in the house, in the home, that is, in the domestic house. So 
this government has got a real choice to make. Are they going to be uh, Morrison light or they're actually going to dump a bad policy and help people? It shouldn't be that much of a conundrum to decide whether to give $244 billion to the rich or to make childcare free, fix homelessness and put dental and mental health care into Medicare. I'll go now to Senator Roberts. Thank you. Mr Acting Deputy President. If the Senate is talking about tax and cost of living, we cannot ignore the most regressive tax on the poor and the vulnerable. Parliament is considering it now. $244 billion over 10 years barely registers compared to the trillions, the trillions of dollars in economic mayhem that climate change and related energy policies are already inflicting and going to continue inflicting and getting worse. Make no mistake, climate change and related energy policies are a brutal, highly regressive tax on the poor and the vulnerable. Trying to tax carbon dioxide means trying to tax every single thing we do as humans, including breathing. That's why the United Nations and the World Economic Forum is pushing these burdens. They want to control every single thing we do. For these policies, the poor will always proportionally pay the highest price, by far the highest price. Rich inner city elites can afford to buy a brand new electric vehicle. The poor cannot. The rich can afford the outlay to install solar while they get back with that they get back with subsidies that the poor pay for through higher electricity charges. The poor cannot. The rich will be able to afford, afford it when power bills go up. And despite promises about the wind and solar pipe dream, power bills are skyrocketing and will skyrocket. The poor cannot afford it. And while life gets harder, and more expensive for the poor. Billions of dollars are being poured into the doomed wind and solar pipe dreams. Companies receiving government subsidies to build wind and solar complexes are giant multinational companies, quite often Chinese, associated with the Chinese Communist Party, and run for the benefit of billionaire CEOs, billionaire owners. Climate change policies are like a reverse Robin Hood, taking taxes from the poor and giving to the rich, thanks to the Greens, the Liberal Party, the Labor Party and the Nationals. People on the minimum wage will suffer as life gets more expensive, much, much more expensive. As more intermittent and unreliable wind and solar is forced into the grid and reliable baseload power is prematurely forced out, power bills will go ever higher. As productive farming land is locked up for carbon dioxide credits that the Nationals, Liberals, Labor and the Greens want, groceries will get more expensive. So let's talk briefly about the carbon dioxide credit rort. If a producer of carbon dioxide pays for enough trees to supposedly offset carbon dioxide, they'll get the green tick of approval and continue producing carbon dioxide. It's a tax, a hypocritical tax, a destructive tax about everything in life. Because the end user, the customer, the people will pay. The credits don't stop anything. They just say companies can do it as long as we, the people, pay a, f a tree fee. Of course, that includes a fee to the companies and government and the United Nations for their apparent services in managing the system, a tax. There are many more examples, and no one should be in any doubt. Climate change policies and related energy policies try to change the entire country, the entire economy. These changes will restrict almost everything, everything, making life more expensive. The rich will be able to afford it. The poor will not. Climate policies are a highly regressive tax on the poor. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Put simply, greens are bad, tax cuts are good. Cutting taxes is good for your family, it's good for Australia. Indeed, it is our patriotic duty as Australians to fly our flag, cut our taxes and have a barbecue. Because I don't know about you, Mr Acting Deputy President, 
I want Australians to have more money in their back pocket. I want, more, I want Australians to decide how they spend their money. So I want to cut taxes. I came into this place to cut taxes because we believe in freedom. We believe in the right and the might of the individual to decide how they spend their money. And what we're seeing today is the Greens come into this place because they think they know better than Australians. The Greens want to tax Australians more. They want to tax Australian business and Australian families because the Greens love taxes. Well, I love cutting taxes. So the more taxes we can cut, the better Australia will be and the freer Australians will, will be. Because the Greens have come in here and because they're a pack of liars, Mr Acting Deputy President, they are saying that this is a tax cut for billionaires. Well, they are a bunch of liars, the Greens party. Uh, let me say this, because McGrath, guess what? Senator McGrath, I will have to ask you to withdraw. I, I wasn't yeah. reflecting on an individual. I just said the Greens were a pack of liars. It's a, yeah. Yes, uh, Senator McGrath, uh, I ask you to withdraw. I've been advised that it would be against. I will withdraw, uh, Mr. Okay. Mr. Acting Deputy President. But let, let me put it this: the Greens um, and people who sit uh, with the colour green uh, in between, to the teal, towards the dark green, uh, they wouldn't know truth if it fell on them from a high, high place. Because if these stage three tax cuts are repealed, it means a teacher who earns seventy thousand dollars a year will lose. $620. A nurse earning $90,000 a year will lose $870. And a diesel fitter, oh, diesel, oh, it's a scary word for the Greens because they don't like diesel. A diesel fitter earning $100,000 a year would lose more than $1,370 a year. The tax cuts are all about middle Australia. So the Greens come here, these, these, these whinging, whining, pathetic people, they come in here with their extensive property portfolios. Do you know the member for Ryan, Mr Acting Deputy President, has four homes? Homes, oh. uh, but four homes. But how many of those homes do you think are out for social housing? So I say to the Greens, oh, who love please. taking the money but don't like sharing it, because they are a bunch, a bunch of hypocrites. Because, and here's the other fallacy being spread by, by, by these fairies at the bottom of the garden. They're saying that those who earn more don't pay their fair share. Well, how wrong is that? Because when stage three is fully implemented, an individual with a taxable income of $200,000 who earns 4.4 times more than an individual with a taxable income of $45,000 will pay 10 times more tax. 10 times more tax. So this is why we come into politics. Ladies and gentlemen, we come into politics because we believe in freedom. We come into politics because we want individuals, we want businesses, we want families to grow. And the best way for, for Australians to grow is for them to have more money in their back pocket. And this is why these tax cuts, when they are implemented, are so good for Australia. But, but Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm going to let you in on a secret. And the secret is that I suspect that, that the jellybacks on the other side of the chamber will do a deal, and they'll do a deal with the Greens, and they'll do a deal with the Greens, and, and it'll be a power sharing uh, a deal, as Senator Scar pointed out, and they'll do a deal, and these tax cuts will be no more. That they'll do a deal because you listen to the language of, of people like the, the Minister for Finance who's sitting over there. And they're not strident in the defence of these tax cuts. They're using the, the wishy-washy language of, of the Labor Party. So do not be surprised, and this is breaking news, that these tax cuts will not proceed because of the weakness of that side. And how wrong is that for those of us who believe in freedom and believe in cutting taxes you, because Senator we Gough. want you to have more money Thank in your you, back Senator pocket? Uh, Senator Shoebridge. President, this government's priorities are cooked. Labor is giving a $244 billion tax cut, largely to the wealthy and to billionaires, but less than $2 a day to people on JobSeeker. Does that sound fair? Yeah. These tax cuts are grotesque and they're self-serving. Members in this parliament are proposing to give themselves a $9,000 plus tax cut, billionaires a $9,000 a year tax cut. Uh, and no doubt, no wonder the coalition senators are here supporting it. $9,000 sounds nice, thanks very much. Meanwhile, I've met nurses 
nurses just last week who have been forced to work 31 shifts in 28 days because there's not enough money in our public hospital system. I've, I've met students who are sick from the black mould toxicity in the, in the substandard housing that they're struggling to pay rent for, uh, and it's still costing 50 per cent of their income. And we have Labor and the coalition saying they want to give billionaires and politicians a $9,000 tax cut. It's disgraceful. This parliament should be fighting for the many, not the few. But right now, this government is dishing out favours, favours to billionaires and big corporations. And they talk about a living crisis. They say they're standing with workers. But on the really big decisions, the ones that are the $244 billion decisions, which is make or break on fairness, they say they can't do anything about it, that they agreed to it a few years ago and they've just stuck. Well, here's a message to the Labor government. You are now in government. You're not stuck with the coalition's uh, rotten tax agenda. Have the courage, stand up and, and, and reverse these tax cuts. Cancelling these tax cuts mean we can get dental and mental care into Medicare. Think about the changes that that would make. Dental into Medicare. It is outrageous that in this country one of the key indicators of your class and your wealth is the state of your teeth. And the only reason that is, and the only reason that will be next year and the year after, will be if Labor doesn't have the courage and reverse these outrageous billionaire-focused tax cuts. We can make childcare free, and we can pay early child educators and all teachers a fair wage. But we can't do that while well, we hand out $244 billion in tax cuts to billionaires and politicians, and those already have enough. This parliament should be standing alongside those early childhood educators who are out there today taking action for better pay and conditions so they can look after our kids and our grandkids. That's what they want to do. And a shout out to the United Workers' Union and every single childcare worker. Stand strong. The Greens are with you. We support your calls and we'll keep fighting for you until we reverse these tax cuts and give you the pay and conditions you deserve. Childcare educators are striking today and they're calling for this parliament to put children before profit. And that's what Labor needs to do. Put people before profit. Put nurses, midwives, healthcare workers before profit. Put teachers and students before profit. Put First Nations people across this country before profit. That's who this parliament should be for, not the billionaires who don't need another tax break, but for the millions of Australians who are desperate for help while their wages are stuck and expenses are skyrocketing. This parliament should be standing up for young people, for people on Centrelink, people with disabilities, First Nations people, people without a home, people renting and unable to even think about owning a home in this country. But these people will be worse off under Labor's tax cut. This parliament should be for every single one of you who needs our help. And to all of you, I say this. The Greens believe this parliament should be for you and Thank will you, keep Senator fighting to make good on that promise. Expired. Now go to Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, Acting President. Australia has a proud history of a progressive tax system. The stage three tax cuts are a watershed in relation to that history. They represent a turning away and we know that we will never get back what we are going to give away with this reform if it proceeds. We need to hang on to a proud Australian tradition, which is a tax system that looks after the bottom and fairly distributes the resources to the services that every Australian needs. These tax increases will give, give as we all know, I hope every Australian knows, $9,000 to billionaires. $9,000 to every one of us in this place, but nothing for those on minimum wage, nothing for the working poor that Senator Pocock spoke about, the other Senator Pocock, nothing for the workers out the front of this parliament today who every day turn up for a, a job that pays them just over $20 an hour. I think a lot about the care economy. I think about the economy that delivers care for our children care for people with disability, care for our older citizens. All of us in this place over our lifetime depend on that care. And we all know that in depending on that care, we need to 
to look after it fairly. We need to make sure that those who are helping looking after our kids and grandchildren and our parents and other friends or whatever with disability, that we uh, properly reward and support those workers. We have a care economy in this country which is starved. It is thinned out, it is underpaid, it is overworked, it is disrespected, and the, the stage three tax cuts are a doorway to making a historic intervention to fix that economy, which we, will be good for um, the future of our country and good for our country um, and the citizens of this country. As an economist, I know that when, th when things change, when economic circumstances change, we have to change strategy. Only a fool doesn't do that. This policy was wrong at the time it was shaped. Labor knew it and Labor opposed it. It is totally wrong now in such different economic circumstances. We are in an inequality crisis. The top of Australia has run away from the bottom. We can measure it in housing, we can measure it in the quality of care, we can measure it in our health care, we can measure, measure it, as my colleague says, in our teeth, in the quality of our teeth, and we can certainly measure it in a cost of living crisis, which is leaving so many Australians uh, under such pressure. Today I met with Sam, a, a worker at Port Lincoln in South Australia, who came to the parliament to talk about his life as a carer of a, for a household of people with disability. Sam works for $23 an hour. He's been doing the same job for four and a half years as a casual. He feels disrespected. He feels underpaid. He feels exhausted, and he loves the people he cares for. He says, I love the guys I care for. He is working for love, and he has not paid enough money. And It is vitally important that we uh, stop the stage three tax cuts and turn to the parts of our economy that are so desperate for our attention, for our resources, and for our care. We must not pass the stage three tax cuts. Thank you, Senator Pocock. And we will come back to this debate, but it's now time to move to first speeches. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Little to make her first speech and ask honourable senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Little. Thank you. Thank you, President and fellow senators of this 47th parliament. In my, making my way as an elected member to this place, I contested two Liberal Senate pre-selections, two federal election campaigns, one in 2016 and again in 2022. I have spoken with many hundreds of party members, listened to thousands of voters at shows, street corners and shopping centres across South Australia on the issues that matter to them most. At the 2022 election, with a marked level of concern, people spoke of increasing costs of living, individual and nation security and safety, health and mental health, housing for owning and renting, and environment, and it was not all about climate change. The observation, in a nutshell, there's a desire for relative certainty and looking forward to a better future, not looking back. What I learned from these interactions was the importance of listening, not to the loudest, not to the most resourced, not to the most organised, but to all the voices. With experience in executive management and leadership across some of our largest and most economically significant industries, much of my work has been in the true engine room that fuels our economy, the private sector. I've owned and operated several successful small businesses worked and volunteered in not-for-profits in health, the arts, tertiary education and more, focusing on governance and on social and economic participation. As a working parenting adult, I earned undergraduate and postgraduate university and coveted industry quali qualifications, securing the tools that I have since known have served me well. In life, education and work success, success has not just been mine. I am here because of those who gave unwavering support in regular, reliable and sufficient measure, and somewhat ironically also by those who did not. When the detractors, the hecklers, the naysayers told me my dreams were impossible, unachievable or simply unlikely, 
My response was, was quite quickly, sit back, watch carefully, they are not. Standing six feet tall, 183 centimetres, I'm used to references in relation to height. So it is with that that I acknowledge those who stood beside me, behind me and in front of me, and on whose shoulders I leaned on, almost cried on, but most definitely stood on to get here. To my grandparents who have long since passed, who laboured to build vast pastoral empires on country to which they will forever belong, Corporate Harold Little enlisted to fight under that flag and on, and on behalf of that flag on that what then was king and country. His sacrifice is rightly forever remembered. To my mum and dad, Jeff and Jean, watching from their home in Alice Springs, Arunda country, I watched you show up, stand up, speak up, time and again, with courage and conviction. Together you've defied the narrative, the stereotypes, the statistics, holding sacred belief in individual responsibility, reward for hard work, a fair go, and being the masters of your own destiny. From the stars up above and from the Senate gallery and across this country and the globe are the children and grandchildren that have benefited from observing those values. My older sister worked in education and administration. Before her potential for greater contribution was cut short by a despicable act of violence that killed her. My younger sister joined the South Australian Police as a police officer, completed a science degree, an honours law degree, and is now contributing to the area of justice to tackle injustice. Another younger sister completed a degree in agriculture science, then a PhD in environmental science, to further enhance her love, understanding and respect for traditional Aboriginal land management practice. The youngest of our clan, my brother, who's actually made it here, has possibly the highest level of responsibility. He's flown in the skies in a now 30-year career as a captain, in fact, a training captain, for a major international airline. My parents knew that structural, emotional and economic barriers and challenges were real for everyone, but could be overcome by commitment to a very good plan and support from decent, good people. Indulge me as I thank my own family, my partner of 30 years and our children, who I have been asked not to name for fear of embarrassing them. I love you more than you could possibly imagine. I thank aunts, uncles, nanas, extended family, dearest friends, old and new, too numerous to name, many of whom have been on this long journey and been forgiving and patient. To the Liberal Broad Church, thank you for backing me to back enduring belief in freedom to choose our way of life and living, subject, of course, to the rights of others, for backing individual initiative and enterprise, freedom of speech, religion and association. To the many volunteers who supported the campaign, this was simply not possible without you. I acknowledge especially the work of Liberal members and senators representing South Australia, who helped voters make the decision to deliver a sixth senator for the state. I acknowledge all senators who welcome me here and the work of parliamentary staff who settled me in. Fellow South Australians, now elected, I turn to the responsibility of representing you faithfully with clarity and confidence. My South Australia is a state of more than 1.8 million people who live beside the mighty River Murray, the imposing Flinders Ranges and on the shores of the Southern Ocean. We have the rolling hills of Adelaide and the Flurio Peninsula, the stunning Kangaroo Island, as well as the city of Adelaide, once awarded one of the world's most livable cities. We're already known for our world-class food and wine regions, its rich and vibrant arts and cultural scene, tourist attractions and experiences. We're a place of imagination and invention. Think the Hills Hoist Clothesline, Container Deposit Schemes, the Stump Jump Plough, 
and David Unipon's shearing handpiece. It's people with confidence and capability and the right legislation and policy levers that will unleash the full capability of systems, processes, environments and infrastructure. So based on my personal story, my values and political party, you will see me on my feet for a robust economy, not just for today but for tomorrow, stability and certainty for business and lower taxes and less red tape, good service delivery and accountability, data, monitoring and outcomes, strong borders to protect our people, industry and our native flora and fauna, safer streets, communities, homes and workplaces, no matter your postcode, culture or income, and a sensible, measured approach to addressing the issues around climate that consider diversity and who and how people are affected differently and disproportionately. More locally, my home, South Australia, is at the forefront of building Australia's sovereign defence capabilities, building what we need to help keep us safe. Critical to our security and prosperity, it was the Coalition's belief South Australia should lead the creation and delivery of our vital defence and associated industries. I will be a strong advocate for growing South Australia. It's our food, wine, wool, grain, meat and seafood industries and advanced manufacturing with unprecedented workforce vacancies that must be filled to reflect the diversity of South Australians. Moving now from productivity to people, Australians have contacted me lamenting the devastation and chaos they know will revisit their lives with the intended removal of the cashless debit card. The card is an important part of a broader suite of solutions. It gives power and respite to the most vulnerable men, women and children and the elderly. Yes, those who need it most, and it is those people, not the drinkers and drug users, not the abusers, who will suffer the most from its withdrawal. Indeed, in response to what is a philosophical objection to the card, residents living in areas from Queensland, Central Australia, the Kimberley, Sojuna and surrounds, despite raising their concerns, are not being heard on this matter. Instead, the people are, who are being heard are those screaming human rights. But I say, whose rights are they defending? Maybe you need to live in a town devastated by alcohol, drugs and violence and seen it eroded from within. Not convinced yet? Keep walking in my shoes, having helped care for foster children. Yes, wards of the state, that may help you come to a different conclusion. I've looked after a child, hello Joe, now a man who has fetal alcohol syndrome, never able to live with his parents. Yes, he's had some big hurdles, but he's recently graduated with a certificate four and is still in work. I'm here to tell you his family and the families who raised him couldn't be more proud of him. And yet another child, again from a remote community, who lost his mother to alcohol fueled dysfunction and now lives forever with the consequences of that. So rather than unleashing the rivers of alcohol and drugs and with it more associated abuse and neglect, how about ridding our communities with the miscreants, pretenders, controllers and rescuers. Leave them nowhere to hide or thrive. You know who they are, the ones that are there for the ride, for the cultural immersion or where their apathy and paralysis prevails. Our regulators, our government officials need to do their jobs better and reward those people working hard to work against the tide of culture of mediocrity and keeping only those people delivering outcomes who we know are there for the right reasons. So it was with frustration I watched on, quarantined by COVID, as the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Bill passed this House. In relation to Aboriginal Community Controlled Service Delivery, I paraphrase subsection 2, clause A, which does not require the governing board to have a majority independent uh, executive directors. B, have at least one member of the governing body of the provider having experience in the provision of clinical care. Clinical care is assistance with mobility, communication, catheter care and wound management and more. 
It is one of eight aged care quality standards for safe and quality care and service identified in the Aged Care Quality Standards Commission. The passing of this legislation means Aboriginal community controlled organisations do not have to meet those requirements in the same way as everyone else. Despite caring for the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable, clients with multiple and complex chronic illness and lower life expectancy and in the most isolated regions, there is no expectation of even partial transition to a model that satisfies that standard. Go your hardest if you think that this pushback is racist, ill-conceived, ill-informed or unreasonable, because I'll continue to call out double standards, disturbing assumptions and what I call reverse racism. More broadly, I want our country to think different, act different, demand different, push away from the pressure of sameness, the rejection of discourse, the perils of groupthink. Reject over-policing of language, cancel culture and aggressive social media commentary. All that does is conjure ridicule, creates fears and stifles our potential to do better. I want this country to stop doing what doesn't or won't work, have higher expectations, be tolerant of mistakes, missteps and admit when we get it wrong and celebrate when we get it right. I get angry when others seek to define me firstly or only by race, and I know from experience it is getting worse. I was not an Indigenous news reporter, nor an Indigenous businesswoman, or an Indigenous company board director. I had the same qualifications and experience as everybody else. First and foremost, I am just me. I look forward to objecting loudly to navel-gazing, paternalism, box-ticking, quasi-consultation, <laughs> silly reporting that returns little value and ideas that fail to provide evidence of change. I am inspired by, the, by words in 1942 by Liberal Sir Robert Menzies, pushing back on government that seeks to control and limit freedom, one which seeks to nurse us, rear us, control us, maintain us, pension us and bury us. In short, give me the tools and information I need to make decisions and to prepare for my own future, and help me only when I truly need it. Senator Neville Bonner made history with his first speech 51 years ago this week on the 8th of September. A Liberal senator, he was the first Aboriginal person to enter federal parliament in a casual vacancy and later by popular vote. He believed the interests of Indigenous Australians would best be advanced by working within the existing political institutions, and he lamented too much the unwarranted focus on race. I quote, I am Bonner, proudly an Aborigine and a member of the Australian community, a token of no person. I acknowledge his contribution and that of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander politicians of all political persuasions both past and present. My identity is with Aranda of Central Australia, the cultural group of both my parents. With that, I acknowledge the people and land of the Ngunnawal people on which this house now lies and pay respects to the ancestors, elders, past and present. I want to talk more about equity because it is good for individuals. It's good for our nation and it's good for our future. I think perhaps some of the most rewarding work I've done to date is in helping others into work. But from here, I can encourage that on a much bigger scale. It is in everyday workplaces with sameness, the sharing of water coolers, meeting rooms or boardrooms, the same qualification, yes, the same expectation that destroys stereotypes based on disability, rage, ace, culture or religion, and all workforces and workplaces, workplaces must be safe. As Chief People and Performance Officer at Voyagers Airs Rock Resort, with around 1,000 employees, the target was also to employ 400 Indigenous Australians, around 40 per cent of the workforce. At Santos, yes, Santos, a co company-wide functional oversight on matters related to Aboriginal affairs in employment and training, community investment and cultural heritage, the target was over 700 outcomes in the energy sector, and that was long ago. With opposition leader Peter Dutton, I recently visited Intract, an Aboriginal-owned and operated company. 
It was Santos that gave Contract Intract its first major project, which now employs 75 Aboriginal employees, 90 per cent of them Indigenous. With a target of 5 per cent by 2030, it won't be the public service that will deliver these job seekers work. Instead, look to the private sector, where they've already delivered well beyond single-digit outcomes. In conclusion, we need to teach what it takes for bystanders to speak up and push back regardless of how inconvenient or uncomfortable, and that's in our workplaces, our individual lives, in everything we do and will be better for it. Although, although our television, radio, newspapers and social media echo loudly with tales of panic, dread and doom, I am confident ordinary Australians, the battlers, the fighters, are ready for a sensible, measured conversation on tough matters of mutual and country interest. Having worked on projects to provide protection for vulnerable and threatened species, I too have great interest in the environment but not in a way that supports hands glued to sidewalks, stop others going about their business, or stands in the way of agreements struck with traditional, traditional owners under their right to negotiate legally, transparently, transparently, freely and with informed consent. Common sense beats the emotional, the hysterical, on every issue, every time. Shh, listen. You can already click and hear the click of the keyboards, the ping of the posting and the landslide of protest. I make a commitment to myself that I start each new day, every day. My message to self is rightly quite simple. In opposition, I'll relish working with colleagues to hold this government to account for its promises, legislation and policy in this chamber, in committees and in the public domain. I can't change yesterday, but today, I might just help change tomorrow, and that's why I will stand what I will stand for in this place. Thank you.
Uh, senators, we will return to the order of business now, and I just ask senators to either take their seat or leave the chamber quietly. Um, Senator Wish Wilson, are you? No. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, budgets, of course, are all about priorities, they're all about choices, and they're all about values. And government policies are about choices and values. And the Australian Labor Party has made a choice, and that choice is to adopt Holus Bolus, Scott Morrison's $240 billion worth of tax cuts for the top end, for the billionaires, for the politicians, for the CEOs. And when I say Scott Morrison's tax cuts, of course they were designed by him as Treasurer and introduced by him as Prime Minister. But as of today, they are the Australian Labor Party's tax cuts. They belong now to the Australian Labor Party. And the choice in adopting those tax cuts, those obscene $240 billion tax cuts for the top end that Labor has made, is stark. Because this is the Labor Party that has made it clear that for folks who are on job seeker in this country, they will be condemned to abject poverty. They will be condemned to starvation rations. They will be condemned to having to make a choice every week about whether to put food on the table or pay their rents or pay their power bills. And yet, at the very same time that the government is crying poor, saying we can't afford to raise the amount of money we give to people on JobSeeker, they are in the same breath proposing to give $240 billion worth of tax cuts to the top end, to the billionaires, to the politicians and to the CEOs. And what's their excuse? Oh, they're legislated. And we're not going to relitigate that, said the Prime Minister in the press club last week. Well, uh, a little bit of um, educative uh, work here for the Australian Labor Party. Section 1 of the Australian Constitution vests the legislative power of the Commonwealth in, wait for it, the Federal Parliament. Section 51.2 of the Australian Constitution gives who, wait for it, the Federal Parliament the power to make taxation laws and the Federal Parliament has the power to, you know what, repeal taxation laws. And that is exactly what we've got the numbers to do and the only thing stopping the repeal of these obscene state three tax cuts is the Australian Labor Party. Shame. Senator Allman Payne. We've heard a lot of rhetoric from some people in the chamber around the stage three tax cuts. But we need to remind ourselves that what we are talking about is people's lives. Just before I came into this place as a senator, I was a secondary high school teacher in a public school. I taught students whose families are doing it tough in this cost of living crisis. I taught students who are working four and five nights a week, not for pocket money, but to help put food on the table for their family. Those students come to school tired. They don't have time to do their assignments and they do poorly on their exams because they are working to help support their families. That should not be happening in a rich country like this. I taught students who came to school hungry because their parents or their carers were on job seeker and their families did not have enough money to put food on the table. Again, that should not be happening in a rich country like this. Students who are hungry find it very difficult to learn. 
they too suffer when they are sitting assessments, doing homework and exams. I taught students whose families were living in a shed. I taught students who were living in the open air under houses. I taught students whose families were living in cars. This government is going to give $244 billion to the top end of town while students and their families and their carers suffer. That is shameful, it is reprehensible, it is obscene. How about we take that $244 billion and we raise JobSeeker so that families and their kids can afford to eat? How about we take that money and we put it into housing so that students and their families have a roof over their head? And how about we take that money and we properly fund public education so that every kid in this country has the same opportunities for a good life? Okay, the, the question be that the urgency motion is agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I no. believe the noes have it. Is a division required? Sorry, was that a, is a division required? Okay, a division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that the urgency motion be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. Oh, sorry, I've already done that bit. <laughs> um, I'm going to appoint Senator McKim as the teller for the ayes and Senator Askew for the, for the noes. There being 14 ayes and 39 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative.